welcome to a special, special, special edition of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains because today we are going to be meeting with Arizona's official state historian, Marshall Trimble, and he's going to tell us all about Skull Cave up by Canyon Lake. So let's take it away, Marshall. Marshall, I've heard all sorts of stories about Skull Cave, but what is the real story? Let me give you a little bit of background, uh, Charlie. There, um, um, uh, the Civil War broke out, and it was about the same. It coincided with the with the ac accusation of Cochise of kidnapping that uh, youngster, uh, which was wrong. He hadn't. He didn't do it, but he was accused of it, and um, it led to some deaths and led to a ten-year war. Well. Um, the forts in Arizona were abandoned about that time, so there was no real military presence here. So it was up to the civilians, and people were pretty bitter about the uh, being abandoned by the military, but they were fighting a bigger war back east. And so uh, gradually they began to bring troops in again as the war dragged on. But um, a lot of times the citizens, it was up to the citizens, King Woolsey and people like that, you know, who went out and just did uh, punitive expeditions against the uh, against the Yavapai, Tonto Apache, and uh, further south, the Chiricahua. So all of this was going on, and um, then in 1871, a group of a uh, large group of uh, Toono Autumn uh, Indians from um, uh, uh, Tucson, living near Tucson. Uh, banded up with some um, uh, a large number of Mexicans in Tucson and and some and some Anglo's and they went up to Aravipa Canyon where the Aravipa Apaches were, accusing them of um, of the uh, atrocities out out and around Tucson because it was you could venture outside of Tucson and be taking your life in your hands at that time it was so scary, and so um, they went up there and massacred a whole bunch of them. But unfortunately, most of the warriors were away, and it turned out to be mostly women and children. But they got back, and they were hailed as heroes in Washington, in, in Tucson. Not so in Washington. Um, President Grant called it purely murder, and he said, "We've got to do, we got to make some changes out there in Arizona. So we're going to start a peace policy." So he sends a uh, one-armed general named Oliver Howard out. And um, uh, he was a real religious guy. They, the Apaches thought he was kind of strange because they thought before he ate, they noticed he, 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 he talked to his plate. <laughs> so they were quite amused by that. But um, Howard persuaded the Chiricahua uh, uh, and Cochise uh, to, to make a treaty and, and end the war. So that took care of the Chiricahua temporarily. Uh, and. Um, uh, for as long as Cochise was alive, he kept his word, and they kept the peace. But up here in the mountains, um, the Yavapai and the Tano Apache had been having things their own way, and they weren't they were interested they weren't interested in all in uh, having a, a, any kind of um, a, a, a peace treaty or moving to a reservation. And General Crook had been brought in to quell the sort of quell the problems because the other generals had been inept, uh, incompetent, and so. Um, Crook believed, uh, he'd been around long enough, and he, he, he believed that it was in the best interest of the Indians, uh, uh, the, the Tonto Apache and the, and the Yavapai and all, to, to give up those old ways. Too many people were coming in, and pretty soon the whites were going to be overwhelmingly large in number, and they're just going to go out and kill them, exterminate them, because that was the attitude, as extermination. And so um, he thought, we've got to bring them in. And we've got to get them out there and have them. They've got to stop raiding the uh, the Pima Indians and in the villages on the, along the rivers uh, down there. And um, they've got to give it up. We want to make ranchers out of them and farmers. And and um, it, uh, it it was it was it was a it was something the Indians weren't interested in uh, at the time. They were doing okay as raiders. This is what they knew. This is this is what they did. All right. Well, let's go beyond local government here, as far as the Native Americans, the Indians go, and and talk about the federal government. How did they feel about the Indians? President Grant decided to. Um, uh, it, it was smart. He, uh, we know what kind of a general he was in the Civil War. <laughs> he was, uh, so uh, he's out. We'll, we'll have uh, we'll make it a two a two prong thing. We'll have the olive branch. We'll extend the olive branch and the saber, and um, give you a choice. And so Crook um, uh, uh, Crook decided to 
tried to tell him to come in. He gave him um, it was general order number 10 uh, to come in. You've got uh, uh, till November 15th. Anybody out after November 15th will be co considered hostile. And um, and then here's where here was the, here was the, the wonder of Crook's work as a, as a general at this time. When he came out here, the pack trains were just haphazard and. The troops uh, companies would go out, and they'd be out a week and run out of supplies, and pack trains would break down or whatever, and and so uh, uh, he uh, he just streamlined uh, the uh, pack trains, brought in real good packers, brought in good stock, and um, uh, the, so that was his first contribution. The other one was that he believed that um, Apache scouts would do the job. Uh, they tried other Indians, but uh, didn't have nearly the success. And he and Yavapai, uh, he thought we find these, and he said, I, I, "I want the wilder ones, the better. The wilder ones, the better." And we're going to go out there. And his orders were, um, uh, "Bring in, uh, keep the women and children alive, if at all possible, and uh, and also if all, all possible, the uh, bit, get the men to surrender. Don't kill them. Bring them in. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather bring them in alive and and, and work with them." And something about Crook, he had the respect of the natives more than any other general. Um, uh, Crook was, uh, and I think the reason was, was Crook straight talked. He didn't lie. And uh, when he died, one, uh, 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 many years later, one of the chiefs uh, up in the Northern Plains said, uh, he never lied to us. And that was a good epitaph, you know, for, for uh, General Crook. So, but they knew he was a dog. A do, boy, he, 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 was a, he was a bulldog in battle. And he, he ordered the troops into the field. We, they were going, coming out from Fort Verde, Fort McDowell, uh, Camp Thomas, uh, let's see, Fort Grant, um, and Fort Apache. All of these, they, they were scattered all over what was called Apacheria which is really the central mountains of Arizona, those rugged central mountains of Arizona. And they will start crisscrossing in the field. He ordered them to go out and don't come back. Uh, don't, don't return in five days and say you ran, you, you ran into problems like they were doing before he got there. He said, no excuses given. You stay in the field until we call you in. And we'll keep them moved. We'll keep them moving around. If you don't catch them, you might drive them into another unit over here somewhere else because they're just crisscrossing through the Tonto Basin and the Central Mountains, the Superstition Mountains, Sierra Anches, and all those. So it really was working, and it was a winter campaign. We hit them in winter um, when, when they uh, are all holed up in their little uh, uh, hidden canyons and places like that, their little sanctuaries, and keep them, keep them uh, destroy their supplies, uh, burn them out, sort of like Carson did with the Navajo, uh, during the Civil War, uh, d destroy their food supplies, and so um, it was working, and uh, it was it was getting very frustrating uh, to these tribes because no matter where they went, but the reason that that, that where, wherever they went, uh, they could be found was that other other uh, other bands of their people, and so people would always ask, how come how come these bands would go against each other? Well, what they didn't realize, uh, and Crook did was that these bands, some of these bands hated each other as much as they did the whites. And um, that's what uh, Crook counted on. So he, he would find these bands that were at odds with another brand and then he'd recruit them and enlist them in the army as scouts and pay them. And, um, and it was quite a prestigious thing, you know, to uh, be, be uh, on that, getting made, paid for your work. So, um, so he, had, he had great success and this was his strategy. And that's when he went out. Uh, so on November the 15th, they had not come in yet. Um, Nanny, Chatty, Delche, and uh, a, a number of the Yavapai and Tonto Apache were still out there and still raiding and uh, still doing what they'd always done. So he, um, um, he's, got the, he's got the troops in the field and now they're just, it's just a search uh, looking, looking, for, uh, looking for different bands and keep them moving and get them, get them all stirred up. So by December, um, he has got now Major William Brown of the 5th Cavalry uh, and uh, uh, Captain Jim Burns, uh, commander at Fort McDowell. Um, Brown, was, uh, Brown was the commander at uh, uh, Fort Grant. And this was the old Fort Grant down in Arvaipa Canyon. And so 
Brown leaves on, uh, with his patrol. He's got two columns of cavalry and about 30, 30 Indian scouts. Um, and they go north, follow the, follow the San Pedro across the Gila River, and from the Gila River, they go further north up into uh, the um, Globe area, around the Pinal Mountains, around where Globe is. And, um, and then they kept going, and they went over to the Sierra Ancha, and they didn't find anybody, they didn't see anybody. So uh, that's about where Roosevelt Lake and all that is today in that area. And so he turns back south, and he heads down, and in the Superstition Mountains, uh, he encounters uh, Captain Burns. And, and his, his, he's got about, uh, uh, let's see, he had, he had nearly 100 Pima Scouts with him, too. But um, Brown has got the, Brown's got the Yavapai Scouts. And um, so they decide to join forces, and they headed north, then out of the Superstitions, over towards um, the Four Peaks. And there, they're at the base of the Four Peaks on December 27th, and uh, they're going to go into those rugged, jagged, impenetrable canyons uh, we call the Salt River Canyons and so forth, all that area. And I've ridden in that area, too, and it is rough. You have, too. It's rough country. And um, uh, there's, But they, they were so far in there. In fact, uh, uh, Nani Chadi, who was the uh, the uh, leader of the of the group of Yavapai in the canyons? He said we we many times he bragged you know he bragged at Fort Verde. He says we've seen your soldiers looking for us and we sit up there uh, uh, high above you and watch you uh, uh, look for us and uh, you never found us and you never will. He said he said you never will find us. All right, let me ask you this: How did they find them? And they've got a, a scout. Um, uh, their, their lead scout named Nanti, and he is, um, uh, he, he's got he's to have this, his medicine has got to be just right, and he spots a bear track. So what was the significance of them finding a bear track? Well, to them, the bear track is a good sign. That's a sign that the enemy, you're going you're gonna to meet the enemy soon. And he'll be yours. And so he's all good. And he, and he, he wants to wait until a certain star comes out at night. Marsha, you amaze me. Where did you get all this information? Where did I get all this? Well, John Burke, Lieutenant John Burke, who wrote the famous book On the Border with Crook, he was a young lieutenant, and he was with Brown's outfit at this time, and he gives a firsthand account. Uh, he would later be uh, Crook's aide de camp, and then wrote the great book On the Border with Crook. And it is a classic. It's probably the best primary thing, uh, source of material on the Apache Wars today and the Yavapai Wars. Well, anyway, uh, Burke is with him, and he's taken, uh, you know, he's, he's writing it all down, and um, they, 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 this, that star comes out, and they're ready to start moving. They're going through some scary country because they're in a sharp, uh, uh, steep-sided canyon there. They, uh, they take off their boots, and they're wearing moccasins now so they won't make noise and can move quietly through there. Uh, they're creeping up, and they still don't know what they're going to run into, and it's dark, and uh, if, uh, if it's probably better if, if, you, if it's dark, as if you're, if you're looking, you're going to see it's a thousand foot down to the river if I, if I make a bad step. So they're going along, just creeping along, and um, they, and they spot a, a, an old uh, rancheria. All right, well, I'm a little rusty on my Spanish, so what does that word mean? Uh, which uh, was camp, and they know they're getting close, and then they see some animals, and then they hear some noise, uh, they, uh, they might have been out, Burke thought they might have been out on a raid and come back, uh, whatever, whatever they were, they were, they were, uh, they were not posting sentries, they were just having a good time, and um, they're, uh, they're ready to go. So, you get the, they get them all, they move, they move the troops up, and the scouts are all there, and they close in on that cave. Marshal, you know, Dave and I, a few years back, went out looking for the cave off of Canyon Lake there. We thought we had found it, and it wasn't it. So we spent the whole day for not, so to speak. But, but tell us about the cave itself. Give, give us a little bit of a description of the cave and what we need to look for. Now, the cave is really, it's not a cave. It's just more of a, a dome of some kind, impervious dome. Uh, it, it just a cut out of, of a hollow out of a mountain. But it's pretty good sized. And uh, I've been in there, when I went in there, it was by boat. Uh, we came in, uh, a couple of us, and uh, came in there and climbed up some steep 
cliffs, and then it was a long, long slope um, uh, and uh, up to the cave itself. So there's open areas. Well, that was that was the way we came in from down below from the river, but uh, the troops came in from over the top. They were they were up up here coming down, and they got they got down to this area, and then uh, they they were able to form in front of the cave, and um, uh, they were ready for action. But first, Major Brown um, uh, calls them calls on them to surrender. Well, there was just a bunch of defiant cries uh, coming from inside the cave. Of uh, uh, they were they'd never been beaten. Uh, there's no reason to think they were going to get beaten this time. But um, um, firepower is going to be important here. So uh, Brown Brown uh, Brown opens fire, and there at one point in the <clears throat> in this fight. They have a, a a little boy wanders out. They were shooting, and they, actually they were shooting at the roof of the cave, and the bullets were ricocheting down, coming down, you know, just ricocheting bullets flying all over. The, so they were taking casualties in there, and the little boy comes out. He has a little minor wound, and um, he's uh, uh, he just poor thing is but, but crying, you know, he's scared, and uh, not he uh, uh, the uh, scout. He runs up. And he grabs the kid and takes him back uh, to safety. And for that, he would later be a, uh, awarded the Medal of Honor. His name is down at the state capitol with the heroes at the hero play, uh, his, uh, engraved on that on that uh, monument. So um, anyway, there uh, it's here comes Captain Burns. He'd been out on patrol, uh, uh, gone up another way, and he was up above. And he he comes up with his troops now. And um, they're looking right down on the battles down below them. They're up here on a high cliff looking down. And, and uh, he decides, comes up with an ingenious plan. Um, uh, I, I call it uh, 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 the hanging chads, I guess. <laughs> um, they take their suspenders off and they make little harnesses. They, they, they come up with two harnesses and they lower these guys over the edge of the cliff in a harness. You get great visuals on this. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, they, they, they've got pistols. And so they just start shooting. They start shooting. And then, and then they get carried away. When their pistols are empty, they, start, they threw them. <laughs> he said, he hauls haul them back up. But he, that gave him an idea. Let's roll boulders down on them now. And they started a young avalanche. Avalanche uh, and um, and uh, it just raises havoc. It, it is it has just gone crazy inside that cave, and um, people are hollering and screaming, but um, still defiant. Well, why didn't they let the women and children out of the cave? Brown had said, "Bring the uh, let your women out, and they'll be safe." And no way, they were defiant too. <laughs> so these people were not gonna, you know, they were they were not gonna give in. They were brave. They were they were fighters. And so um, the, um, but uh, after the avalanche, there's just nothing but chaos inside. And um, there are, uh, I think they counted the dead when they, when the soldiers went in, they counted the dead. And there, there had been about uh, 76, 76 uh, in there and about 57 of them were warriors. So there were several women and children among the dead. And they captured, uh, they had eight, uh, 18, 18 women and children captives was all they wound up with. A little sidebar there. Um, one of the one of the ones captured was a, a, a little boy named uh, that would become his, his name would be changed. Uh, Captain Burns adopted him, uh, a young boy, about oh maybe eight years old, and Captain Burns actually uh, raised him uh, and uh, got him educated. And when Captain Burns died, uh, uh, General Merritt took over the raising the kid, and he they named him Mike Burns. And he became, he wrote his, he wrote his biography uh, uh, years later. And uh, it's, it's available, it, uh, that, that biography is available. How long did the battle last? The last it lasted till noon. The battle had started uh, uh, probably about daybreak uh, when they could see where you were and it lasted. So it lasted for several hours. And um, by that time, one of the captives said, um, uh, there are, there are our people all over this canyon, and they're going to be coming, and they're going to be coming for you. So um, uh, Brown and Burns had decided we don't even have time to bury the dead here. They just buried the one, one, one uh, uh, scout was killed. 
And they just left the dead in the cave? And uh, we just, we got, we got to get out of here. And they went back over the top uh, with the captives and, um, uh, and they sent an advance group down for medical help. They did not have a corpsman uh, or, or medics with them in those days or any kind of a doctor. Later on, that would be part of the, the standard operating procedure. But there, was, there, were, there were no medical supplies, which is e even for your own people. Many of us know Canyon Lake, but before that, you know, it was a big canyon, Salt River Canyon. So what was the terrain like trying to get up to that canyon? It was almost impenetrable because uh, you had the river in there, the, the Salt River in there. So there wouldn't have been a whole lot of room. Um, and uh, with, with a lake there now, it's much easier to get in there. You just get a boat and go up right to where the cave is. But there, you, you know, it was, it was a very difficult trail. But these people, this is where they lived. This was, this was, um, this was their home. Why didn't they come from below? It would have been a, it would have been a difficult climb to get up there because uh, you came in from, if you came in from the river and uh, the troops came in from above, but uh, the, most of the time you came up the canyon, followed the river. And, uh, and then they went up into this, uh, this gave them a commanding view to from that cave of anybody coming in, they could see, uh, uh, it, uh, they, they could see any, anybody looking for them. Now, but that was so rough that the, the soldiers had a hard time going and negotiating that. And again, the, the scouts, this was, this, was their old, this was their old playground, you know, the, these, uh, these uh, Yavapai scouts. They, they knew that area well. And, and Nanty uh, had been there and, and lived there, and so he knew the area. And then he'd had a fallen out with bands, you know, it was a band um, uh, thing that he was, he, he was uh, vengeful. So I don't know what. Uh, what the problem? What 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 the band? But these bands did uh, did fight and fiercely, and the Apache the same thing. And this was uh, uh, this was the this was the way, way the, you, that you could get good scouts. Okay, at the time of this battle, was there any mining going on in the canyon? Down, oh no, down no, in that area? no, no, no mining or anything like that. Nothing going on. Just it was just wild country, and um, it was some of the wildest. The you know, the soldiers commented, and Burke especially commented, that just the, the, this was the wildest country in the whole United States. To, and it was a perfect place for the Apache and Yavapai to have their lairs. But they, just they left the dead ones in the cave. And it would be 19, it was 19, 1906 when um, uh, Jeff Adams, who would later be, uh, you, I'm sure you ran across his name with the, with the uh, Dutchman, Yes, I have. And uh, Jeff Adams later be sheriff of Maricopa County, and he was taking a picnic in there w with a woman, and um, and uh, they they just happened to wander in there, and here here were all these all, all these bones, and it's quite a date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't take her to dinner. Let's just no, go. Just, just go. Let's just go picnic in the uh, up into Salt River Canyon. So. <laughs> Let's see, and there would have, there still would have been no dam there. They were still, uh, they were still building the dam at that time, way, way up, up at Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, I guess he loved the wild country. Maybe she did too. I, I hope know. so. <laughs> and they just stumbled upon the cave? Yeah, because the whole thing was forgotten. And, um, but, but with the casualties, 76 casualties uh, are dead. Um, that was the most costly to the Indians battle in the entire history of the Indian War, of the Arizona, uh, because never, not even the Battle of Apache Pass, did the Apaches have any kind of, or, or, or the, I say Apache, they were Yavapai Apache, uh, and have, have that many casualties as they did there at Salt River Canyon that day. Marshall, we've talked about the date that it was found. What was the exact date of the massacre? 1872. 1872. It was December 28, 1872, and that pretty much broke the back of the resistance. A couple of months later, they had another one at Turret Butte, which is over on the Ber Verde. Marshall, have you ever actually been to the cave? Yeah, and I remember thinking, um, this is really hallowed ground. Oh, yeah. And I knew it would be to the Avapai, and it should be to really, uh, should be to anybody because um, uh, of, of what happened there. And people trash, would trash, you know, drop, uh, just trash in the place. And, uh, it's so maddening to go out there and see that and just think, you know, you should, you should take your hat off when you come here and like you do with the Alamo. Were the bones ever given a proper burial? 
uh, yeah, the bones were the bones were picked up uh, by the Avapai people and given a proper burial. Oh, okay. So, uh, and I believe at McDowell, at Fort McDowell. Okay, so they brought them out of there after, mm -hmm. it, later this, on. This yeah, nineteen oh six, or did they? It was. It would have to be after that. Yeah, and um, the uh, because uh, the, the fort uh, Fort McDowell was was abandoned uh, in the eighteen nineties, the end of the Indian Wars, and then it was turned over to the uh, uh, the the Yavapai Indians. The Yavapai had been, uh, when they surrendered in 1873, uh, 2,100 of them surrendered at one time to General uh, Crook in Camp Verde or Fort Verde. And, um, uh, and then, wouldn't you know, uh, the best friend the Indians had was General Crook, and Crook was transferred to the Northern Plains. He had a rendezvous with Destiny at a place called Rosebud on the way to meet with General Custer. And um, and so uh, and, and then they were up there, you know, with the twin buttes, and they were fighting. And they were really fighting a formidable foe up there with it, with the Lakota. But um, but Crook left, and when Crook left, things started to go bad here. Um, the Chiricahua were then taken away from the reservation that had been awarded them, uh, which was down in the Chiricahua Mountains. That was their home, but they were they were moved to San Carlos, and. Um, uh, it, it was. It was. This whole thing was a fight between the Department of War and Department of Interior for who's going to who's going to have charge of the Indians. So what they were attempting to do is to mix all the tribes and put them on one reservation. Yeah, the, the Chiricahua. The, well, there was no love lost between the Western Apache, pretty much, and the Chiricahua. But they wanted to group them all together. They wanted to put them all together. Yeah. On one reservation. Yeah. And San Carlos, uh, which was Hell's Forty Acres, they called it. It was just no well, it's nothing to write home about today, and uh, then of course you had the White Mountains. But the White Mountain Apache, they had allied uh, Alchesi and people like that had allied with the uh, with the army, and when the army wins, uh, they got they, you know they got prime property which they have today, and um, but uh, the Chiricahua, um, they got a one way ticket to Florida. And uh, never were never were allowed back in Arizona officially. Um, they let some of them uh, around in the 1900s. Uh, they read Fort. They moved them finally to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And by that time, they'd been you know several generations. And so they they uh, they but they never they they never came back as a as a tribe. Um, and any time they did, the other Indians didn't want them uh, either. Uh, it was it was resisted so to this day. And the bad part of the sad part of it is we're talking about scouts. When the war ended and the Chiricahua were sent to uh, Florida, they put the scouts with them too. Their only crime, they were, they were Chiricahua. All right, so after the scouts helped them so much, they rewarded them by putting them on the train and sending them off to Florida as well. Martin and Keita were two scouts who were with uh, Charles Gatewood when they persuaded Geronimo to surrender. And um, they went on, they were, they were put on the train too. It was a real crime. And Crook had a fit. Crook was now retired um, and uh, when all this was going on uh, from the army and um, uh, he, he, but there was nothing even he could do. He fought for him, but to no avail. Marshal. I really appreciate you sharing this story with us. I, I believe that it's a, a, a tale that really needs to be told. Yeah, so that's a tragic, that's the, that's the whole tragedy of the thing is that um, it could have been handled, it could have been so different, it could have been done differently. Well, there you have it, straight from Arizona's official state historian, Marshall Trimble, as he tells us all about Skull Cave. Join us again for the next edition of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains when we share more of the mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.